guys had a wonderful weekend. Enjoyed the unseasonably warm weather. Just a little bit of a treat. Um, all right, so today we're going to talk about a new organizational strategy that allows us to uh, make our code easier to use and more useful to others. And this is the concept of uh, organizing our code into functions. A function is one piece of code, it's one piece of logic that does one thing. And then we can reuse that uh, in our programs without having to write down the algorithm or the steps that the function takes over and over again. So uh, this is where we're going today. Um, and to some degree, what we're introducing here is really a new organizational strategy. The code that you see inside of, for example, this function that I have up on the title slide should not look unfamiliar to you. This is just using the same ideas that we've been introducing over the past couple weeks and that we're gonna continue to practice with. But functions allow us to make our code more reusable uh, and also prepare us for things that we're gonna see in the real world. All right, so, you know, at this point, I hope you guys are sort of uh, adjusted to the rhythm of this class. This is how things work. Um, today is the first day that the daily homework problems will be due every day, the day that they're assigned. So the you know, intro set was due yesterday. Starting today, there's a problem out today. That problem is due today. There'll be a problem out tomorrow. That problem will be due tomorrow. There'll be a problem out Wednesday. That problem will be due Wednesday, okay? This is what we do from now until May. Today's the first day that we're gonna run our full, um, uh, full slate of office hours down to 403. Um, we have uh, an MP that we're releasing today that you guys will start working on. Um, so again, this is sort of how we set up the semester. And our goal here is to try to, one of the things that we've done very consciously in this class, and we're, we're constantly working to improve this and tweaking it every semester, is we want you doing a little bit every day. But we also don't want, you know, one particular day or one particular week to be really awful, okay? So, you know, we want you kind of working steadily, um, consistently throughout the semester. Um, and the reason for that is because that's how you learn. You don't learn by cramming the night before an exam, uh, taking it, and then forgetting everything. Like, that doesn't work. So what we want you to do is not do that, right? We don't want big spikes. Not to say that there won't be one or two days in the semester where you're a little behind on the machine project and you have to catch up and you'll remember those days later. But our goal is to try to spread things out for you evenly um, so we avoid those hot spots. We avoid those big peaks in intensity for the class. Um, so in general, I mean, this is sort of how how things are gonna work from here on out. Uh, on either Sunday or Monday, you'll finish some portion of the machine project. Again, starting today, pretty much every week, from now until the end of the semester, you'll have something due on Sunday or Monday related to the machine project. There's a few exceptions around spring break so that we could fit things together more nicely. Uh, but in general, you should be expecting to finish some part of the MP or an early checkpoint for the MP uh, where Again, this is our way of encouraging you to get started, get some points, get something done in the first week that the MP checkpoint is out so that you don't crash and burn in the second week. Um, on Monday, um, you know, you come here for class. Uh, we release a new part of the MP. Um, you might take your quiz in the CBTF. Uh, we have homework and office hours uh, from 12 to 8. On Tuesday, MP's still out, have a quiz, go to lab, you do your homework, right? On Wednesday, you know, it starts to look pretty, pretty uh, similar on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Um, weekend, you know, no homework from now on the weekends, so hopefully that makes you happy, but we will have an MP out for you to work on, on the weekend, and we do have weekend office hours from 12 to 8 on Saturday and Sunday, and that's a pretty important time for you to come in and get help. All right, any questions about the schedule? I just, you know, since we're here all together, um, so again, you know, First couple weeks are a little unusual as people are getting settled and people are adding and dropping the class and stuff like that. But from here on out, you know, this is what we do. You know, and hopefully, again, you'll start to settle into a rhythm. My suggestion is, you know, again, you find time every week to work on, you know, your work for this class, particularly on the MP. That's a new component that you guys will start seeing today. Um, and you're gonna need to find time for that. My suggestion is find a chunk of time between 12 and eight during the week on one of the days we have office hours and come to office hours. Just plan on being in office hours during that time. You don't have to have a question. You don't have to have a problem. Just come to office hours and work on your MP or maybe work on a homework problem if you're done with the MP or whatever, to work on something. 
When you come to office hours consistently, what happens is that, A, it's a way of blocking off time so you make sure that you're getting enough work done so that you can keep up with the class, but also you'll start to recognize other students, you'll start to recognize the staff, you'll get to know some people, it'll feel friendlier and kind of more, you know, more enjoyable, right? Because you'll be around some of the same people every week, right, that are on a similar schedule. So at this point, you know, and, and we talked about this on Friday, we basically covered all of the basic computer capabilities that make them exciting for us to work with and learn how to program, right? Um, we'll talk more later about communicating and, and, and you know, uh, both between computers and with humans, um, but we, we've done all these things, right? We've worked with basic math, uh, I've taught you how to use conditional expressions, you know, how to make simple decisions, uh, we've looked at loops, um, and we've worked with data, both singletons, single data values stored in variables, and also arrays with all, which allow us to store multiple data values in an order, in order, okay? So what are we gonna do for the rest of the semester then, right? We already crossed all this stuff off our list, what's next, okay? So here are the big challenges that are gonna occupy us. We started talking about this on Friday. Algorithms, how do we use computers to solve problems? So the homework problem that you worked on yesterday is an example of an algorithm. Right? It's a simple algorithm, but it's an algorithm, finding the maximum of a series of values. Right? There's a way to do that. There's a way to program a computer to do it. Hopefully you figured that out yesterday. If not, we'll go over it today in class. Okay? Data structures. So we looked at our first data structure on Friday. That was an array, but we'll look at several more during the semester. And this is a preview for material that you'll see as you go on into 173, into 225, and other courses in the department. Because one of the ways that we enable algorithms, one of the ways that we enable decision making in computer science and, you know, gaining insights from data is by structuring the data in a particular way. And it's particularly important for certain algorithms that rely on data having a certain structure to operate efficiently. And then finally, and again, the MP is one of the big places where we give you practice with this, software development. So I want you know, if you take no other class in computer science at Illinois, I still want you to come away with some experience of being able to build something real. You know, you guys are gonna sit down with the MP today, and like I said on Friday, some of you are gonna start freaking out, and you're gonna be really intimidated, but look, this is a real thing. If you learn how to do this, you can build Android apps. And when you're done with an app, if you have an interesting, useful app, you can publish it on the Google Play Store, at which point billions of people can download it and use it. That is real. That's not make-believe. This isn't, you're not building a toy bridge out of Legos, right? You're not like writing a report on some issue for a class that no one's ever going to read. You can create something that your mom or your grandfather can use. That they can download on their phone and use it and then they'll complain to you when it crashes, right? Um, you know, so this is, again, a level of impact that you don't get exposed to in very many courses. It's not easy, right? You know, building a full app there's a lot of complexity to it. We will walk you through it carefully step by step, but this is why we do this. And I hope you guys, you know, enjoy this journey, right? I find this a lot of fun. I'm hoping that I'm trying to embody some of that as I, as I teach this material. One of the reasons I teach this course is I really like doing this stuff, so I enjoy it. Um, so hopefully along the way, we'll have a lot of fun together as we learn these things. Okay, so now that we know how to manipulate basic data stored in arrays, and work with some of the Java sort of basic building blocks like conditional expressions and loops. The next thing we want to think about is how can we bring some additional structure to our computer program, right? One of our goals here is going to be able to, whenever we, so, and this is going to be particularly important when you start building larger pieces of software. So when you sit down today with EMP, you're going to see there's a lot of code in there. And if you think about the software that you guys use on a daily basis, right, like a web browser, for example, or maybe an app on your phone. Those, that software constitutes probably hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lines of some programming language, maybe Java, depending on what, what you're using. And, you know, all of that has to be maintained and improved and, you know, fixed by a large group of people. And so trying to make sure that a big software project stays organized and somewhat interpretable by the people who work on it is also a function of structure. So how do we structure our code so that other people can understand it, or also sometimes maybe so that other people don't have to understand certain parts of it, all right? 
when we start talking about objects, we'll talk about combining state and behavior. So these are the different approaches that we're gonna learn this semester to improving the structure of our code. We'll also talk along the way about documentation. That's something that we'll require that you to do in a few places on some of the empty checkpoints. Okay. And then also reuse, reuse existing stuff, right? So whenever you're building a real piece of software in today's world, it's very likely that a lot of the problems that you wanna solve have been solved by others. And one of the things that we'll, we'll show you how to do, again, later on in the semester as you continue to work on the machine project, is work with code that other people wrote that might solve a problem, which means there's one problem that you don't have to solve on the way to building your app that changes the world, right? Okay, and then sharing our code and got it. Okay, so today, right, it's a long intro, sorry. Um, so today we're gonna start talking about functions, right? So this is our first organizational strategy for how we start to make our code more reusable and also make it easier to test and easier to maintain. Okay. So a function is a sequence of program instructions that performs some task, okay? Um, and, and that it's packaged then as a unit and that unit can be reused throughout my program, right? And so wherever I need to perform a particular algorithm or accomplish a particular task, instead of rewriting the code, so if you think about the code you wrote to find the maximum of an array, let's say there's three or four or six or eight places in your program where you need to accomplish that same task. You don't wanna keep cutting and pasting that code into every part of the program where it's needed. Uh, particularly because if you find a problem, then you have to run around and fix it everywhere. So instead what we're gonna do is we're going to repackage that code, and we'll see how to do this later in class, as something that's called a function. Functions on some level share their name with a mathematical function. Right, which, which you know, performs a simple, uh, a similar operation. So in Java, the idea of a function is that you, you provide it with some Im information as a starting point, okay? This is sometimes referred to as the function arguments or its inputs. And then what it does is it goes off and it does some work and it hands you back a result. The result, um, you know, might be a single value, the result might be it has done something or rearranged the data that you gave it or something like this, but the idea is you know, you give it some information. So for example, going back to our maximum of an array, you might say here's an array of numbers. Find the maximum for it. So you provide the array and then the function does its work and it comes back and says here's the max, right? Um, and I can give it any array of numbers. I can give it an array with five values, an array with 50 values, an empty array. Um, I give it whatever inputs I want, and it essentially is performing, trying to, to accomplish the same task, right? Whatever array I give it, it's trying to hand me back the maximum of that array. When we, later in the semester, we'll talk a little bit about how to generalize this, and we'll start to think about what does it actually mean for there to be a maximum? What if my array is full of strings? What does it mean to have a maximum over a string? For now, let's just think about this in terms of numbers, where most of us understand the idea that one number is greater than another, right, or less than another. So the maximum is something that's pretty intuitive. All right, so, and, and functions essentially represent a way of establishing a block of code. Inside that block, it's the same thing that we did when we wrote a loop, same thing that we did when we wrote an if-else statement. Inside that block, you can put whatever you want. You know, you can create variables, you can write loops, you can have conditional expressions, whatever you need to accomplish the task that the function set out, sets out to accomplish. So good functions have really a couple of things in common. One of those things is they do one thing well. It's sort of the idea, right? A function accomplishes one task that you can specify very easily. So find the maximum of an array. You wouldn't write a function that was like, find the maximum of the, of the array or print hello world. That doesn't make any sense, right? You want it to do one coherent thing. You could have two functions, one that prints hello world, one that finds the maximum of an array. But you don't have it done by one. We try to have it set up so it does one thing well. That also allows us to test it easily. So we can ask it to uh, solve certain problems that we already know the answer to and make sure that it's correct. And when we do some of the examples in the playground for the next few weeks, you're gonna see me doing that. And when you guys work on the MP, we're gonna provide you with test suites that you're going to have to, um, you're gonna have to get all those tests to pass in order to get full credit on that part of the MP, all right? All right, sorry, and, and then because it does one thing well, 
it allows me to reuse this in multiple places. So anywhere I need to accomplish a particular thing, I can, instead of reproducing the same code, I can insert a call to this function. All right, so let's look at a function declaration in Java. So this is now new syntax for us to look at. All right, so let's peer at this for a few minutes together. Okay, so what I have up here, this part, this is a comment. But it's a comment that's structured in a very specific way that I'll come back to in a minute. This is something called javadoc. This describes what the function does, and it describes the parameters that the function takes and what it accomplishes. And this is useful because you can use this to automatically generate documentation about this function so that it's easier for you to use and for other people to use. But all this is a comment, and so this is technically ignored. I shouldn't say technically, it's ignored by Java. The real work starts here on line eight. So this is a function declaration, right? And there are a couple of parts to this. So if we start from the left, the first thing we see is a type. This is int. So for the functions that we're gonna be looking at for the next um, few weeks, they, the, the return value, this is what the function returns. So when it's done, it's gonna tell me a result, and the answer it's gonna give me is going to be an int. The next thing is a name. This is like a variable name. It's up to you to create it. This is how I call the function. If I want to perform a particular action, I need to use a name, and in this case, I'm, the name is add. Choosing good names is important because the name should describe what the function does. That way, when you're reading your code, it's easier to figure out what's happening. Now I've got two parentheses, and here are the arguments to the function separated by comma. Now, the arguments might be empty. It's possible to have a function that takes no arguments. We can see examples of that in a minute. This function takes two arguments. The first one, and here I have both a type and a name, right? This looks a little bit like a variable declaration. So the first argument to this function is an argument called first number, that's of type int. The second one is called second number, it's of type int. The types here are important. So when someone tries to use this piece of code, you're telling them that in order to add, to call the add function, you have to provide two arguments. Both of those arguments have to be integers. Um, now I have a block of code. So I have this open curly brace and the closed curly brace on line 10. Inside this block, I can put anything I want. Here, this is a very simple function. All it does is add the two numbers together. And this is one of the first places you'll see something called return. So return is a special statement in Java, and what it does is that it returns a value from a function. So when Java reaches a return statement, the function that it's executing will stop, and whatever the arguments to the return statement, whatever the argument to the return statement is, is returned as the result of calling the function. So when I call add, the result I get back is first number plus second number, which is what I would expect. Now again, is this a particularly useful function? No because if you want to add two numbers in your code, just do first number plus second number. There's no need to have a function, but it's a simple example for us to see the syntax here, okay? And again, there's a, there's a number of different parts of this, right? So let me just go back and go through them again. The type, this is the return type. So anytime I call add, I'm gonna get an int back. The name, this is the name of the function. That's up to you to define. One, zero, one, or as many arguments as you need. So this is the data that I'm providing to the function so that it can do its work. Here, I'm providing two numbers. Then I have an open brace, and that starts a block of code that contains the code that constitutes this function. So that starts on line nine and goes until this uh, matched uh, closing brace right here. Inside, just like with my if statements and my um, loops, I indent to the right. This makes it easier to read so I can tell where the function starts and stops. Then I, this function only contains a single line of code, and what it does is it returns the result of adding the two numbers together. Return is a special statement. As soon as the code inside my function reaches a return, the whole function stops, and whatever I pass to return is returned as the result of calling that function. Questions about this before we go on? Although it'll probably get a little bit less abstract in a minute. Okay, great. All right, I just said all this. 
So how do I how do I use a function? So now I've declared this function, right? I've told Java that throughout my code, if I call this function add and I pass it to ints, what I expect to get back is the those two arguments added together. And I can call a function anywhere I would normally have an int value, right? Now the code that calls the function, this is some important terminology. So the code that calls the function is known as the call. When a function is called, the code that called the function essentially stops, and it waits for the function to finish. So when I call add, and we'll see some examples of this in a minute, when I call add, the, the function that's running stops, and then the program starts executing the add function, and will continue executing the add function until it returns. Once it returns, the caller now has the result of calling add, and then it goes on and continues executing, okay? The result can be used anywhere that I would normally have an int. So I can assign it to a variable, I can use it in a conditional expression, um, I can ignore it, all right? Do I have a playground here? Okay, let's just do this one. All right, so one, and I, and I apologize for this in advance, one unfortunate uh, bit of confusion in, involving our playground example. So in the playground, which are, these are this, in this environment that we use in class to experiment together. Um, if you want to declare a function right now, you have to use this keyword static. I am not gonna talk about this yet, we will get there, but this is just a result of how the playground works. So everything else is just what we saw. You see the return type, the name, an argument list, this is first number, second number, the, return, the types of my arguments, but I have to throw this keyword in front of the function. This is unfortunate, I apologize for it. It's how the playground works. All right, so let's walk through this code and see what happens. Now, one thing I wanna uh, make clear is that when you declare a function, that code doesn't execute right away, okay? You're essentially telling Java how to perform a particular set of operations. So when I start executing this code, what happens is on line two, I'm telling Java, I'm declaring a function called add. Whenever I call that function, here's what to do. And then I provide the instructions that need to happen. And I also provide the arguments that add needs and I tell it what it's going to return. Now, when I get down here to line five, let's think about what happens. So line five starts to execute. And remember, you, a lot of times when I read assignments, I wanna read them from right to left. So let's start at the right side. That is now a call to our function add. This code is calling add. So line five is the call. So now what's gonna happen is I'm gonna start executing add. Now I'm passing two arguments here. This, I'm passing literals as arguments. I'm passing the literal three and the literal four. When add starts to run, it, it's like I've defined these variables for it. So you might have asked when we defined the function, well, what's the value of first number? Or what's the value of second number? And the answer is whatever the caller provides. So here the caller is providing three and four, which means I'm gonna jump to line three, and I'm gonna, um, at that point, first number is equal to three, and second number is equal to four. Then I'm gonna return first number plus second number, that's seven. So then this function returns, and now this statement is finished evaluating. And the result seven is assigned to the variable result. All right, so let me, just coming out for the rest of this, and we'll just look at just this, okay? And then let's print. Well, actually, you know what, let's do this. Let's print here, all right? So again, this is the first thing that the program does. The first th three lines from two to four are just a declaration. That code is not executed, okay? So now let's print in our familiar print statement, we're gonna print first number, just to see what that is. And I'll print second number. And then I'll put a print statement in here. And this is only to allow us to understand the flow. There we go, okay. Right? So, and then this is important, particularly for you guys that are new to this. Okay? or may have had just a fuzzy idea of how this worked from your explorations with Python in the past. So when this program runs, see that there's nothing printed 
the numbers aren't printed when the function is declared because that code isn't run. It's only run when the function is called. So the first thing that gets printed is this line here. Then I call add. So my code here stops running. It jumps into the add function. It prints first number and second number because I added those statements. So first number is three, second number is four. And then it prints done. So then this statement finishes and I print done. And let's print the value of result too for fun. Uh, I have, oh, right, I can't print it before it's defined. That's a good point. To Java? Better. Yeah, okay. Any questions about this? Then now, is, now is the time to ask, right? If you don't understand the simple code flow examples, things get more complicated. It's going to get worse. Yeah. So which one do you want? What, what do you want me to try? Oh, this will compile. If I do 13, what? Ah, right, okay. So the question is, playground's slow today. Um, why can't I do this? So remember, Java is going, is, is, Java tries to help you as much as possible. So here's what happened. You told Java that you were creating a function called add. But you told it that you needed two integer arguments to run. When I call add down here on line 14, sorry, let me scroll down here, I'm only providing one argument. So the problem is that Java's gonna say, look, like, there, there's a, you know, you, you haven't done what you told me you were going to do here, right? You told me that add took two arguments. I'll just move it up here so we can see it more easily. You told me that add took two arguments, but now I only see one, so I don't know what to do. And so this code won't compile, right? The compiler is gonna say, wait, hold on, you know, something's wrong, right? You made a mistake, and this is actually really useful, right? Because I did make a mistake, right? Uh, we'll talk about, uh, in a couple of classes, some ways of fixing this, so I can provide actually two different versions of add, one that takes one argument, one that takes two arguments. Now, I'm not sure why add would ever take one argument, that seems a little redundant, but but I can provide another version of the function that takes a different type of argument, right, or a different number. But right now, the only version of add that Java knows about is a version that takes two integers. So the same thing will happen if I try to provide three. So you might think, well, this is kind of silly because I should be able to add three numbers together, right? Same problem. You said, here's how to add two numbers, and Java doesn't know how to call add with three arguments. Good question. Other questions? Yeah. Ah, okay. So, so the question is, what's the difference between printing and returning? So system.out.println displays a result to the console. Return calls, causes the value of the function to um, evaluate to a particular result. Right? So I can take these print statements out, and I gotta get rid of this guy, and the code still works, right? Okay, now let's try this. Let's try plus second number, but let's not, let's take out the return statement. Yeah, so now Java doesn't know what to do. Every function has to reach a return statement that returns a value of the type that it's declared to return. So here the problem is, I got to the, so when Java was trying to uh, evaluate the definition I provided for add, it said, wait, you told me this function was gonna, re was gonna return an int, but you never returned an int. Now I can return anything I want, right? So I could have a buggy version of add that returns an incorrect value. So now you'll see that my add function 
this first print statement is printing 3 plus 5, which is 8, but then my result is 9 because I made a mistake. Good question. Other questions? So these, the system data out that print lens that we put into our programs when we use the playground are really just a way of us finding out what's happening. This isn't something that you'll normally do as a programmer in real life. Because if you call system.out.println on Android, the user doesn't see that. It goes into some special log area that only developers will see, right? So normally when we're writing functions, we're a lot more concerned about what the return value is, right? The print statements that we use here are really just a chance for you guys to get a sense of what's going on, right? That's why we put them in. All right, so let's see some other places where we can use our other ways in which we can use our function. So I can call the function and then print the result. So when this, when line six is evaluated, what happens is Java starts evaluating the line and it realizes it needs to call this function add. So it calls the function add, add and passes the arguments four and five, and then it prints whatever the result is. So now what's gonna happen is I'm gonna print nine. So again, I can use a call to add anywhere that I would use an int. So as an argument to print, I can use it as part of a mathematical statement, right? So now I'm taking a bigger result that's the result of adding two numbers, adding two more numbers, and then adding another number, right? Um, so there's two calls to add there. And again, let's put in our So let's see what happened here, right? And actually, let's, let's get rid of this other guys. Let's just look at line eight. All right, so what happened here? So I started to execute line eight. The first thing I did is I called add with 10 and 20, so I see those printed out. The next thing is I called add with 20 and 30, so I see those printed out. Finally, I add in the 10, and now Java knows what value to assign to bigger result. So I start on the right, I do all the work to figure out what the value is that I'm using for my assignment, and then I send it to the left, and now bigger result is 90. As I mentioned last time, I don't have to store the result of calling a function. Um, whoops, sorry, I have to give it the right number of arguments. So for example, that last call to add, let me take out this print statement now, So what happened on line 10? I ran add, and then add passed back a result, and what did I do with it? It's just gone, right? So if you don't assign it to a variable or do something with it, Java will still run the code, but nothing happens, right? It's kind of, so this is dumb code, because when I call a function, usually I want to save the results. All right. So let me just go back, and we'll talk again about sort of choosing good function names. This is very similar to choosing good variable. So choosing good function names are descriptive. When you call, so essentially, the function is now a placeholder for the code that the function runs. So when you use the function in your code and you're reading it, when you see a call to foo, you don't like, you don't know what foo does, right? So again, let's say, go back here, I can call this whatever I want. I can call it foo. Right? It'll work. But now if you're the poor person reading this code, you're like, foo 1020. Who knows what foo 1020 does? I don't know, maybe there's a well-defined, in your generation, maybe foo means something, but in my generation, foo means, doesn't mean anything, right? So I don't know what this code does, right? So I wanna use a function and that's descriptive of uh, what the function is and indicative of what its function is, right? You know, you can try to be as succinct as possible, but my, my suggestion is always err on the side of being descriptive. Don't try to trim things down. It's better have a long function name that does a good job of describing what the function does. All right, so, and, and when, so when a function begins running, the arguments are the way that you pass data to the function, right? Um, when the function starts running, any arguments that the function has declared are set to the values that were provided by the call. 
So you can almost think of these, you know, we just did a couple of these examples, right? You can think of it as when int starts to, when add starts to run on line nine, there are already two variables a variable to it. One is called first number, the second is called second number. Those variables are ints, and the values are whatever was provided by the call, right? So again, it's almost as if there was an int first number equals three, int second number equals four for this particular call, right? They, they receive whatever values the caller provides. Okay, we just did a bunch of these examples. Return immediately exits the function and returns a result. So this is really, this can be difficult for people to understand, but I wanna really emphasize it here. Return statements can appear anywhere in your function. In a loop, in a conditional, wherever, right? Um, a function can include multiple return statements, and a lot of them do, because the value depends on some other, you know, property about the arguments, right? Um, as soon as I reach a return statement, the function exits, okay? Period. There is no, that, that the, a return is literally always the last thing executed by a function. And as soon as I get to a return statement, the function exits. It's over. It doesn't matter if there's other code. It doesn't matter if I'm in the middle of a loop. It doesn't matter. If I get to a return statement, I am done. And a function must return a value of the type that it declared it was going to return. So we saw that in, a minute ago when we commented out the return statement. Then I get an error message from Java saying, you told me that ab is going to return an int, and I don't see a return statement. So the last part of this that I want to, you know, um, to, to point out is this. And this is important, right? So I'm going to uh, spend a minute here. Uh, we will show you how to write what's called Javadoc as part of the MP. We're not gonna ask you to do it on homework problems or in the CBTF. But this is really important because this is, so all the stuff we've been talking about, that's for, the, that's for the computer. The Java doc is for other people that might eventually use the code that you wrote. And the, jo the documentation um, tells them how to do things. And so essentially what, what Java doc allows you to do is you put documentation like this in your code right above the parts of your code where it belongs, and there's a program that you run that spits up something that looks like this. So if you've already looked at some of the online Java documentation, this is all generated using a tool called Javadoc, right? So for example, um, this is a class, this is the string class, which we'll talk about next week. So if I go down here, this is a constructor, I don't wanna do that, right? So for example, this describes one of the methods that strings provide, don't freak out if you don't understand this. We'll talk about it next week. Um, all of this information is for you if you're trying to use this method. So now you know what it does, right? And there, there's Javadoc somewhere that contains this, right? That gets run through another computer program and generates this website. All right. So going back to Friday, right? We talked about algorithms, right? A set of steps used to solve a problem. Good functions frequently implement an algorithm. Remember we said that we want our code to be reusable, we want it to be one piece of functionality. Algorithms frequently are a perfect fit for encapsulating in a single function, right? So an algorithm, as we talked about on Friday, is a set of steps that we use to accomplish some task. So now I write a function that embodies those steps, and I provide the function with the way of operating on different data while accomplishing the same task. So we talked about maximum, right? Finding the maximum of an array. I give it any array of values, it will always return the maximum, right? And so the functions, again, the, the, the block of code inside the functions just uses these same building blocks that we've already talked about, right? All right, let's actually, maybe we'll come back and do this one in a minute. The one I want to do, since uh, you guys did it, on the homework yesterday is maximum over an array, okay? So here's an example of a place where let's write an algorithm. And then, actually, we'll show how to encapsulate that algorithm as a function, right? So we'll repackage it. So if I have an array of integers, um, how do I figure out which value is the maximum value? What's the algorithm for doing this? Now, whenever I ask you for an algorithm in class, I don't want to hear about code. I want you to say write a for loop, whatever. Describe it in English. 
Imagine that instead of an array of algorithms, you have a bunch of numbers written down on paper. And you're gonna hand them to a friend, and your friend is gonna try to figure out what the maximum is. How do you do it? Someone describe a series of steps that you can use to solve this problem. Okay, so I'm definitely gonna look at each number one by one. Okay, so imagine you've got those numbers written down on pieces of paper. So I'm gonna say, show them to me one by one, All right? Okay, and now what do I do? Okay, so let's think about the first number. The first time I see a number, do I know, it, 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 could that number be the maximum? Yeah, because I've never, I haven't seen any other numbers, right? So I'm gonna save that number for later. Then what do I do? Somebody right here had an idea. Yeah, so then I, then I say, give me another number. So then you hand me another number. Now I've got two numbers. What do I do? I keep the bigger one. The smaller one I toss, because it can't be the maximum. If they're equal, what do I do? Doesn't matter, keep one or the other, both the same. Then I say, give me the next number. And I repeat that over and over until you're out of numbers. So in every step, I have the number that is the maximum of all the ones I've seen so far, and I have a new number that you just gave me. I compare the two, and I keep whichever one's bigger. If I repeat that set of steps over and over again, I will eventually end up with the maximum. So let's figure out how to do that in code. All right, so I've got values. There's a missing semicolon there, sorry. So when, whenever you approach a problem like this, let me give you some problem-solving advice. Don't try to solve the whole thing right away. This is not gonna involve a lot of code, but let's still, let's go step by step. So what's the first thing I need, what's, what's one of the things I need to be able to do here? You know, somebody said it right away. I need to be able to do what? What was the first kind of like thing that my code, I know that my code needs to be able to do? Yeah. No, 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 hold on, you're, you're too far ahead of me. Right. What's the, what's the first, con like I, there's a certain structure that I need to my code. If I'm gonna find the maximum of all the values, what do I need to do? Yeah. I need to go through the, I need to go through all the values. So let's do that first. So again, forget about the maximum. Whenever you're working with arrays and you're doing a problem like this, the first thing I would do is just write your loop. Make sure that you can get through all the arrays and let's do something simple with them, like just print them. Okay, so I'm using the more advanced for loop syntax that takes things out. Well, you know what, let's not do that. Let's say for, let's use the old way of doing it. So I have a for loop. This is my canonical for loop. I start at zero. I go through all the valid indices of values, which are all the values that are less than values dot length. I increment every time. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna print values i. Okay. So now, and if I look at these numbers, I see I got all the way through 10, so I'm good. So now I know that I'm getting through all the values in the array. All right, that's great. So now what do I need to do? All right, so now I'm going through all the values, that was good. What was the next thing I, I needed to, there was a piece of information I need to remember. What is that? The maximum value, right? So I need to remember the maximum value. Now, now here's where things get tricky, okay? What should the initial value of my maximum be? Yeah. Well, okay, but well, give, give me some bad answers. What can it not be? What might you be tempted to do? I could say something like this, right? Right? Okay, let's try this for now. Let's just say that we'll start off with a maximum of zero. Okay? And then, what do I do in my code? So now you give me numbers one at a time, and what was the step that I needed to perform? Somebody remind me? So the new number is values, subscript i. My current maximum is maximum, what do I do? There's, there's two cases I need to handle. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I need, I'm going to have a conditional statement based on the value of maximum and this new value. All right, so I'm going to get rid of my print statement now. And actually, you know what? Let's, let's write this differently. Let's say if values is greater than maximum. So if the new value that I just found is bigger than the maximum, what should I do? This means I found a new maximum. So I need to change the current maximum that I'm keeping track of. So if, does this make sense, everybody? If the new value is greater than my maximum, then I set the maximum to the new value. When I'm done, Let's print the maximum. And let's see if this works. It's a little slow, but okay. Is this the maximum value of the, of the array? It is. Is this correct? Hmm. Who can give me, who can give me a case in which this will not be correct? Yeah, what about if my, what if about if these are my values? What's the maximum value of this array? Negative one, you guys can see that yourself, right? What's my code gonna print? Zero. So this is the tricky part of this problem. The problem is that when I'm choosing the initial value for the maximum, what do I really need to do here? Yeah. Yeah, so I need to choose a value from my array. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say it's values zero, it's the first value. Now this will work, okay? There's one little last little fix I can make here. Anybody see it? It's this tiny little optimization. Yeah. I could do that, yeah, but I'm actually, uh, the optimization I'm going to do is actually going to prevent me from doing that. I don't need to look at the first item again, right? All I need to do is look at the rest of the item. So the first item I already set to my max, that was the first number you gave me. Now for the rest of the numbers you gave me, I apply this algorithm. Okay, good. Let me go back and do some announcements and then we'll go back to that if there's any questions. So um, today's MP checkpoint is up. Um, it should be available on the website. The uh, you guys have, depending on your deadline day, either Sunday or Monday a week from now, you guys have a checkpoint that you need to get to in order to get 10 points. The full due date of the MP is not this coming weekend, it's the weekend after for MP0, okay? But please get started on this. Today, from 12 to 8, we have our first full slate of office hours. Today is a day that we have a lot of CAs signed up for office hours because it's normally the deadline for the orange team. It's not a deadline today, but if you want to get started on the MP, trust me, there will be a bunch of happy, well-trained CAs who will be really excited to see you if you go down there today between 12 and 8. My office hours are here from 4 to 5 only. Keep in mind that starting today, homework is due the day it is assigned. Good luck on the quiz. I will see you guys on Wednesday.